What's up? <laughs> Clearly, I'm, I'm not a tech dude. But the most important thing is, ah, uh, I'm really having problems. I press it, I press it. It's, oh, I get money. So hold on, let me see. Let me, I'm gonna go for it. Oh, yes, all right, it works. So that's, that's me, I get money. And what I'm here to teach you today is, don't be afraid to offend people, right? Do not be afraid to offend people. And one of the things I find very interesting about people starting businesses, they're, they're embarrassed to get money. They're embarrassed to be chasing their dreams and get money and be successful. They're always apologizing. Every pitch meeting I'm in, every, every brand I meet, people are always like, it's not about money, it's not about money. It is about money. You should not be embarrassed to be about money. And I'm about money. I'm also about a healthy disrespect, right? Life is a pool <laughs> inhabited by sensitive, small-minded, boring people like this woman on this floating yoga mat. <laughs> All right? She makes, this woman makes no sense. She wants to float on this yoga mat as close to the water as possible, read her book, check her cell phone, and not get wet. It's under, she's totally unreasonable. So I was in the Hamptons. I saw this woman. I told my boy, I said, you want that technology shit? Get your iPhone ready. I'm going to cannonball. I got this chick, her book, stupid wet. But you see her man? That's her boyfriend in the back. He loved it so much, he was taking a photo too. Because he's dating this unreasonable woman, so he's the most unhappy. But that's the thing with business. Customers, they're unreasonable. Before you even have a chance to put your product out there, to put your name out there and tell your story, all your friends, all your... All your uh, counselors or consultants, everyone's telling you all these things that you need to be or that you can't be or that's going to offend people. Don't listen to any of them. You're the only one that matters. And if you don't tell your story, nobody's going to buy it. All right? We all know what people expect. Every single one of us is different, idiosyncratic, rare, and really, really special. So you just want to be that person. Like, don't ever let people curb you. So my life as an entrepreneur started when I was six years old. I ride for Optimus Prime. I love that motherfucker. <laughs> All right. My parents were so cheap and Asian, they would never buy me toys. <laughs> so literally, my mom was like, look, I got you a toy. It's a pot, and, and, and there's, a, there's a spatula. Just like hit it. And she would just put me in the kitchen floor, give me pots and pans, and those were my toys. So I. I wasn't for that. I saw all these other kids in America growing up. They had Ninja Turtles, Transformers, Thundercats, and I was like, I'm not going out like this. I'm <laughs> not going out with fucking pots and pans. <laughs> so my first business, my first entrepreneurial activity was as a six-year-old, I started doing people's homework for their Transformers. <laughs> I did mad homework. I did everybody's homework, and I had this huge bag of Transformers at home but I like, would hide it in my closet behind all my clothes so my mom would never find it because she'd be like, you know, she found it, she'd be like, where did you get those Transformers? But one day, this woman showed up at our door, rang the doorbell, and it was one of the kid's parents. And she was like, look, your son's been stealing my son's Transformers. Mom's like, you're stealing people's Transformers? I was like, I didn't steal them. I did their homework. Like, I earned it fair and square. <laughs> and the parent was like dumb pissed at her kid my mom though was really proud of me she's like look you got to give the transformers back but i'm proud of you you're a businessman <laughs> and i don't know if she realized what she unleashed but then i started selling mad jpegs <laughs> 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 so you all uh, y'all tech people like you all all remember aol chat rooms right I was like in seventh grade in AOL chat rooms, and I remember seeing like Daisy Fuentes on MTV, and I'm like, I gotta see her titties. I gotta see this girl's titties. <laughs> so I went in these AOL chat rooms like, yo, I got Jenny McCarthy, who got Daisy Fuentes? And I was like trying to trade. And I realized, I was like, yo, you could get like one image, scan it in from like your dad's Playboy, and then you could trade those images for multiple, multiple images. So I would take one and I traded it for a bunch. Then I was like, I'm going to take this business one step further. 
I started putting all these JPEGs on a 3x5 diskettes and selling them at school to kids. Because <laughs> these are the kids like had no idea like how the porno hustle worked. And I was like, yo, I got you. <laughs> and so from, from JPEGs, I started bootlegging CDs. I started playing ghetto rummy. And I started all these various Asian businesses. And <laughs> They were all very successful, but they got me in a lot of trouble, and I ended up going to five different schools in seven years. I was in detention all the time. I was suspended, but I was having a great time, and I knew there was nothing wrong with me. I was like, this is, this is the entrepreneurial spirit. I'm not ashamed of it. I get paper. And <laughs> yeah, when I could and I was old enough and I could bounce, I went to a place called New York where people appreciate a good bootleg. <laughs> and I've been great ever since, but I got to New York, and that, that fucking city is expensive, right? That was my first studio apartment in New York, and the new business I took on, we stayed with the Asian theme, I started importing rare Nikes from all different parts of the world. So Nike has this program called Nike SB, and it was built on like building street credibility, limited edition, quick strike sneakers. Even in New York, there'd only be like 60 pairs of like the Dinosaur Juniors or something. Uh, when they came out, they had like De La Soul shoes, they were the most sought after, most valuable aftermarket sneakers in like the entire Nike empire. So I started getting them from cities all around the world that didn't have the market for them, whether it was Australia, sometimes it was Iowa, sometimes it was New Hampshire, Hong Kong, and I would import the sneakers into my 400 square foot studio apartment and I literally lived like this for three years. But I was balling and nothing's that crazy if it works. So me and my friend Steve, we started selling these sneakers on Craigslist and every Saturday morning when the shoes would drop at other stores, I'd open up my apartment and there'd be a line of kids down the street in New York all wearing crazy fitted hats and strange sneakers and Native American prints waiting to buy the things I had in my apartment. And it was a lot of fun. But I was one of those people that I needed inspiration to. I always wanted to be inspired. And about two years into selling sneakers, I saw this magazine cover. I was in Arizona. And this magazine cover changed my life. I saw Obama's face, and as somebody growing up in America, where, to me, America always looks white, black, and one aisle of Goya cans at the supermarket, I gravitated towards Obama, because everyone thought Hillary was gonna win, and I was like, who is this dude? He really has a chance, like, who is he? Like, I related to him, clearly, you know, I grew up on hip hop, I grew up on a lot of like, African-American culture, I saw it and I, I gravitated. I started reading about him and I loved that he stood up when nobody else would stand up and oppose the war in Iraq. And I was like, this is somebody I can get behind because he always speaks his mind. I mean, he's not speaking as much now, but <laughs> <laughs> he, he did always speak his mind. And um, I read about him, I really liked his policies and I said to myself, I'm about getting paper, but I need some whys. I need a why I'm getting some paper for my own self-fulfillment. And I loved the sneaker thing, I stayed with it, but I, I saw people also really into street wear, t-shirts, hats, pants, and the t-shirts would a lot of times have hip hop messages, subversive messages, but not really political messages. And so I decided, I said, you know what, I'm gonna make political street wear shirts. That Christmas, the Jordan 5 Fire Reds were coming out, Chicago colors, black and red, just like Jordan. And I decided to take Michael Jordan's rookie jersey and it said Chicago, but I put 08 and I put Obama 08 on the back. And I started selling them to stores. And I started a company called Bergdorf Hoodman because, <laughs> yeah, Bergdorf Goodman obviously is like that super fancy department store that none of us shopped at. And I was like, yo, I'm Bergdorf Hoodman. And, um, you know, obviously we ended up on BET. <laughs> and then, um, it was, it was a lot of fun, and, and I started making these Obama shirts, but initially when I started making them, there was a lot of friction. People didn't believe in it, and they were like, yo, you're in New York. Hillary owns New York. Like, ev all of New York is behind Hillary. Hillary's going to win this election. Obama has no chance. Like, we don't want to align ourselves with that Obama brand or your brand because we think it's going to offend people. And I told them, I said, look at your customers. Look at who we're serving. Like, we're not going to offend anybody. All our customers are Obama supporters. And I said to them, if you care and you want to make a difference, use commerce. Use commerce to make a difference. I didn't decide to go volunteer for the Obama campaign. 
I didn't go canvas towns. I got money. I got money, and I donated a lot of it back. But my belief is that you can do more for people by being commercially viable. And not only can you help with money, but if you have a valuable product, people will listen to what you have to say. And the most important thing is while you're getting money, don't forget your whys. All right? That's the most important thing. So I only had two stores in New York carry the shirts initially. And it was, they were all on consignment. They were like, if it sells, you get paid. If it doesn't, you got to take it back. And they only really did it for me because they were my homies. But in March, about a month after trying to sell them around New York City, I got an email from this guy, Nima. And Nima is the founder of Digital Gravel, which is the first company to sell streetwear online. He had a really good relationship with artists in San Francisco, LA, New York, Hong Kong, uh, the Middle East, everywhere. He'd carry everybody's shit. And Nima godfathered streetwear because there's only so many customers you can reach in New York and LA, and these streetwear brands couldn't scale. Nima made it possible for people to scale and to ship worldwide. And there was almost, it was like an online magazine because you went on every day. Nima had new shirts, they had new messages and all these descriptions. And Nima gave me a phone call and I never thought I'd get a call because at that time he was probably the biggest guy in streetwear. I picked up my phone, well, what's up? He's like, yo, it's Nima from Digital Gravel. I'm like, stop playing. He's like, no, it's Nima from Digital Gravel. And he wanted to carry my Obama shirts. He wanted to basically buy all of the shirts I had produced, you know, like 144 of them and go sell them on his website. And I couldn't believe it. And he's like, dude, I have been waiting for someone like you to come around who does the damn thing and doesn't care what people think and doesn't care how many people he offends because he believes in something. And Shepard Fairey is very famous for his Obama prints, but Nima carries Shepard Fairey's brand Obey. And back in 07, early 07, I was making these shirts before Obama even declared his presidency, his candidacy. And um, Nima had asked Shepard, like, yo, we all believe in Obama. Why don't you get behind him and do some shirts? And Shepard and a lot of other streetwear artists were like, we don't want to touch that. We don't want to get involved with that. And obviously, he ended up. But I believe, and a lot of people in Shreer believe, like, that wouldn't happen if there wasn't someone like Nima and someone like me who took a chance and put what they believed out there for commerce. So Nima, Nima's the man. It wouldn't have happened without him. We put the shirts up, and they all sold out the first day. So it's very important to remember your audience. And I believe in the Obama shirts because it was like streetwear is an urban thing. It's a hood thing and, and, and it's a hip hop thing. And I knew that the people in our culture were gonna support this 100%. That's Twista. You guys may remember Twista. He's like the fastest rapper in the world. He was rocking that shirt. Um, this is Noriega. What well, what? Making it happen. <laughs> Uncle Murda, Ghostface. All right, I had these other shirts that were like the Forbidden City and they said just colonize it. <laughs> yup. And uh, we were very on that offend and conquer thing. Um, then, you know, Ghost used to bring me to Rock the Bells. I ended up styling Ghost for his tours and making t-shirts for Ghost and other Wu-Tang members. 50 Cent wore the stuff. Um, it totally blew up. But the most important thing is that I never forgot why I was doing it. I was all about game money. I was never embarrassed about the hustle. I respected the hustle, but I never forgot why I was doing it. And if your cause is big enough, I really believe if your cause is big enough, nothing will curb your enthusiasm. And for people who quit and people who ditch businesses, I believe that it's not meant to be. You didn't really believe in it. But if you find something you really believe in, like when I found Obama's candidacy and you believe in it, you go all the way. I mean, I was broke forever. I was on train selling these t-shirts. I was a law student. People would laugh at me for trying to sell these t-shirts in the cafeteria at school, in the lounge at school. Everyone thought I was a joke, but now, you know, like I had a successful t-shirt business. I was an attorney at a top 50 firm. You know, I have a very successful restaurant in New York. I have a book and two shows coming out. Like you believe in yourself, you believe in the wise, and you believe that what you have to say matters and needs to be heard. And it doesn't matter how many bitches on floating yoga mats think you suck. <laughs> you have to tell your story. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. That's All right, so question, question and answer. So now I want to know, did you become a lawyer because you wanted to be or because you wanted to, your mom to be happy? What's up? Sorry. Did you become a lawyer because you wanted to or because you wanted your mom to, 
D no, I was in a lot of trouble. I had, I had like a couple strikes and I wanted people to respect me. Like I was an intelligent person. Like in college I won the Zora Neale Hurston Award for the funniest. I was like taking African American studies and women's studies. So uh, I won that award. I was a good kid but I was always in trouble and I had some strikes. So I went to law school because my parents wanted me to but also because I knew I needed a piece of paper that was like, yo, he's official, you know? And how did you get involved in food? Uh, I, I was always into food. I grew up in restaurants. My parents owned restaurants. And my dad is a very funny guy, too. He's a hustler. He owned steakhouses in Italian restaurants, but he would hire American chefs to front as the owner and the chef because he was like, no one wants to buy steak from a Chinaman, you know? <laughs> and he was very realistic about his view of America. I got a lot of it from him, but I always liked my mom's food better. So when I got a chance to open a restaurant, I did authentic Taiwanese food that we eat at home, all the techniques and flavors I'm used to, and I did it our way. And my dad at first was like totally against it. He didn't believe it worked, but it worked. And we're like a huge inspiration to, you know, ethnic minorities in America who sometimes are made to feel like their shit isn't good enough, but it is. Uh, you talk about telling your story. Uh, you're very active on Twitter. I follow you now. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> So what, what is your, you think your personality means to your business? Uh, you know, you have a great product, it sounds like with your restaurant, but if you remove your personality from it, you remove your story from it, does that lessen that product or? Yeah, no, definitely. I believe in karma too. And, and the thing is a lot of people are like, look, I wanna keep, restaurants don't take on politics. Restaurants don't have political blogs affiliated with them. But I learned so much from selling those Obama shirts that when I opened the restaurant, I put all my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs onto this blog I was a huge mouthpiece for, for certain issues, especially about identity, race, and food, and immigration. And people gravitated towards it. And there's people that don't even agree with a single thing I write on my blog, but they email me all the time. I respect that you put it out there, and I support your restaurant, I support your food, because it's real, it's genuine, you take chances, and it's, it's authentic. You know, and, and I think that's important is, why not put your personality behind your product? Like, I want to know who's behind Sprouted. I want to know who's behind Skillshare. I want to know who's behind all these companies. Like, why not? You know, I want to know where my money is going because you vote with your money. I, I think your, where you spend your money is more important than where you vote. We vote with money every day, and I want to know who I'm voting for. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, hello. Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. It was awesome. Um, you said that everything's better if it's commercially viable if you want to help people. What do you think about the social entrepreneurship space that's sprung up and this whole concept of we're helping people but we're non-for-profit and we don't need to be commercially viable? Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of saying like not-for-profit because I mean people do get paid and, and it's like why, why should it be not-for-profit? Like, you know, Microsoft makes so much more money than a non-profit does. Like why not apply those same skills and those same methods and that same vigor and energy to like social causes you know like I donated I think five or ten percent of the shirts back to Obama's campaign and that's more than I would have been able to give if I hadn't been selling t-shirts so I think it's very important to see everything as like a money-getting venture yesterday there was a question to the panel about uh, failures things that don't work out can you share a story or two of some that hustle or whatever you're trying to create that didn't quite work out and what a lesson yes that so this is, this is very important. I was telling people the other day, you know, someone was telling me about Big Omaha and how they didn't want it to get bigger. And they were like, we want to keep it this size. We don't want it to get bigger because we want to keep the character. And I was like, you know what? You should get bigger. It's Big Omaha. You should get bigger because if you don't get bigger, someone's going to come fuck it up. You know, someone will create another bigger one very close to you. And just like how people think Southwest by South by Southwest hasn't gotten bigger, everything gets bigger and evolves. You can't help it. And, um, NEMA is a very good example of a, of a failure that I was a part of is NEMA never took ads on Digital Gravel. He was the most honest guy. He always kept it real. He'd carry lines that didn't even sell just because he believed in them. And it was important. But NEMA kept it so pure that there was a void for Karma Loop to fill, which Karma Loop was able to come in, carry only the brands that sold, discount them below NEMA and all the brick and mortar retailers in every town. And Karma Loop single-handedly destroyed streetwear culture. And it's probably not beneficial for me to say that, but that company destroyed a culture that meant a lot to me because there's, there should be 
something involved with like, I bought these sneakers. I want to go to the store. I want to meet the skate kids. I want to meet the hip hop kids at the store. You develop community. But Karma Loop destroyed that community. And I wish, and I talk to Neem all the time about it. I'm like, man, I wish you defended your territory more. Like, I wish you pissed on your territory so that they never would have had an in. And he didn't. And so my failure too, I went down with Nima because I wouldn't sell to the Karma Loops. I didn't sell to department stores. We all went down together. Um, it was honorable. It was like a very Brutus-like death. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, I always remember that quote from Catcher in a Rye, like something like, the immature man wants to die for a cause. The mature man wants to live for one. Like, I would like to live. I would like to be successful. I would like to get paper. You know, so I lost because I was a sucker. Yeah, uh, is there another? Oh, no, yeah. Yes. Um, Hello. I just had a question with everything that you've been doing. It's kind of all these different areas, um, you know, being an attorney and then a t shirt company and now a restaurant. Kind of go through your creative process of how you see the next thing coming and when you feel it's time to move on to the next thing. Um, do you just kind of always have something in the works or um, is it just there when it's there? Yeah, I have this really big bong called a roar. And I hit it every night, and every night it tells me to do something new. No, but um, uh, no, but for real, like I think that's part of the thing about not offending and not being afraid. Is if I want to do something, I go out and I get it. I call somebody in that industry, like, "Yo, what's up? You sell T-shirts? I want to sell T-shirts. How do I do this?" You know, and. Um, I'm not afraid, people like my managers or agents are always like, look, we need to define who you are. People aren't going to understand who you are. You're way too many things to way too many people. And I was like, I don't care. They can catch up, you know? <laughs> if I make a big enough impact, Wikipedia will explain that shit to them, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, um, it is important. I use Google Docs. That's one of the like, only things I'm technologically capable of using. But every single time I get an idea, whether it's like eating or taking a shit or in the whatever, like, I, I will run out of the shower and go on Google Docs butt-ass naked. And my brother's just like, oh, hell no, not again. You know? But like, yeah, I use Google Docs. Anytime I have an idea, I put it there. And when I'm uninspired or I'm bored and I'm looking for another project, I go back. And I'll go find things I wrote down like five years ago. And I'm like, that was ill. Hey, uh, you talked a little bit about not being afraid to piss people off. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about a time when maybe that sort of backfired and it set you back? I was on felony probation for three years of college. That was bad. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah. F fighting, fighting. I, w I got jumped by some frat boys. That was not cool. And, and I fought back a little too hard. So, yeah. Uh, Nonviolence. I'm all about nonviolence. So. I think that's where it backfired. But in business, I can't remember a time where I offended people and it didn't. And it's, you can't just offend people to offend people. It has to be real. Like, I offend people collaterally. It's just collateral damage, you know? But I don't do it on purpose. I'm not malicious. Like, I think that's where people go wrong when they try to be sensational or be someone they're not. Like, it has to be real. Straight to the back there. Uh, I'm just curious. Obviously, you've uh, scaled up past, you know, swapping JPEGs in AOL chat rooms. But walking around, do you still just, like, come up with all these little small-time hustles? Sorry, say, say that again? Uh, obviously, you've scaled up past just these little small-time hustles where you're, uh, you know, trading JPEGs in AOL chat rooms. But is that part of your personality? Like, does that still happen and you just don't have the time for them? And obviously, you, you can spend your time better than that. And if so, what are some awesome small-time hustles you've come up with Yo, lately? Yo, English is my second language. I'm totally confused. What happened? <laughs> Sorry. That are going on. Side projects going. On. Yeah, I mean, like you know, when I get bored, I always will make up like a special at the restaurant, tweet it, promote it, and I promote it like it's a new restaurant opening every single time. It's like on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. I call all my friends, like, "Yo, we got a new item. Let's go eat it." So it's just fun. Like any excuse to throw a party, I think is fantastic. Right in the back, please. So hustle is a huge part of like who you are, your personality, but obviously you've got some businesses that, that have begun to scale. Um, how do you think about going from the hustle and the ideas to you know, kind of building a system? You know, you're looking at your restaurant and that's become really successful, your other businesses. When do you start to transition? When do you bring in other people to actually scale a business? Oh man, that, that is the hardest part. Like finding good staff at restaurants to scale, finding good partners you trust is, is the hardest part. And I don't think there is like a, a definer or whatever. I, I read a lot of Susan Miller on Astrology Zone. She's very helpful. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah.
<laughs> yeah, but um, I don't know, man. I, it's just it's just whimsy. Like I meet someone, I'm like, you know what? I want to do business with you. Let's go do some shit. And and that's really what it is. I gravitate towards people. Like I do it when it's fun. I don't really like. I'm not trying to take over the world. I just want to have fun. I want to express myself. I want to tell my story. So when I need to scale up to tell my story, that's when I do it. I have a quick question for you. I mean, when people meet you, they may not assume that you're a business owner. They yeah. may not assume that you're a lawyer. All these different things. So tell me a little bit about expectations people have of you and do you worry about that in your meetings and how you approach that? Yeah, no, this all goes back to being a kid. Like I really didn't like the model minority, like stereotype and myth. And I was one of those kids they took out of school when I was really young. I was like, yo, you're smart. They put me in like combination advanced classes. They tested my IQ all the time, had me look at like weird psychological inkblot shit. And I was just like, yo, I don't want to be like a lab rat, you know? And I don't want to like have my life determined by my skin or my face. I thought it was really fucked up. So, or my intelligence. So I kind of like played stupid and I would always play stupid. And, and I would, I was an underachiever. I didn't really want to achieve. I just wanted to have fun and I wanted things to be real. But when, when my identity and my culture and, and things that I see that mean a lot to me come under attack, that's when I became an entrepreneur. That's when I decided to be a hustler because I was like, yo, like, it, no one's going to defend the things you care about by yourself, you know, so, yeah. Uh, seeing as you're a big fan of hip-hop, I was wondering if you had any freestyles you could share with us. <laughs> no, I don't. I would not disrespect the game. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is as close as it gets, but thank you. We have another question straight to the back. So if we come to your restaurant, can we use like a code word, Big Omaha, and get a two-for-one special or anything? Done. No, actually, <laughs> my, <laughs> my real question, just uh, tell us a little bit about the restaurant, if you don't mind. It's yeah, no, the restaurant commercial. is really funny. It, it, it meant a lot to people in New York and especially Lower East Side when we first opened because I was walking around and I had, I, I had $30,000 when I opened the first restaurant, which is laughable. And it's even more laughable when 17000 of it had to go into landlord security because I had no credit. And we opened a restaurant with $13,000, all right? Me, my brother, and like three friends worked for free. And we just hustled and it, it looked like a bomb shelter. This place was 400 square feet, downstairs, in a basement. We didn't even have like a bathroom for people to go to. It was just counter service. Our pots and pans were from Ikea. Our stools were from Ikea. Like, uh, you know, it, it, the people might as well have been from Ikea. Like, <laughs> 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 you know, it, it, was, it was a hilarious restaurant, but it was, when people came in, they were like, yo, this is, this makes no sense. They were like, this is crazy. Like, you have music that's offensive blasting out onto the street. You have people getting high outside. You have, like, you know, dirty ghetto kids, like, negotiating for cheaper bow prices. Like, it was just, it was funny. Like, the whole way we did it was unlike anyone else. We totally reinvented the wheel and broke the model. And the food was amazing. That was, that was the best part is if the food was good, but what took it and made it like a cult thing and, and it really caught fire was that the, the experience, the human experience in the restaurant was unlike anything they'd ever seen. Eddie, I'm curious, many of our speakers get a lot of press in major business publications and magazines. Your press is starting to go beyond business. You just ran a, a cover story in the New York Times. So how, are, how is that affecting you, that exposure that you have now? Yeah, it's really important to tell your managers, like, fall back. You know, like, I always... You know, everybody's always trying to tell me, like, now that you're in this position, you need to be this, you need to be that. And, and I'll never change, you know, because the thing is that I don't think people that work with me understand, like, I'm playing with house money. I never thought I'd be here. I never thought I'd be successful. I mean, I was on felony probation in 2003 to 2006. Like, I thought my life was done. But I, I had a good spirit. I knew I meant well. I did the damn thing. And, and I, I don't think I'll ever change. I don't think anything will change. Yeah. Uh, another question for me, and a follow-up to his. Uh, you went out to eat last night in Omaha, wondering your take on Omaha's food scene. And if I get to New York, well, outside of your restaurant, what do you recommend? I'm really glad you asked that. If anybody here is in the Omaha restaurant scene or, like, the, the beef industry, pause, like, you guys got to do something because I went to this steakhouse, and they buy their steak from Buckhead, which is in Chicago. So, basically... There's 1.5% of the, 
of all meat is prime, right? Only 1.5% of all meat is prime. 14% of that prime comes from Nebraska. You guys have the best beef in the world. But this beef, yes, it's true. But this beef gets shipped to Chicago to a distributor, then gets shipped back to these restaurants. Like that carbon footprint is ridiculous. It makes no sense. Like you guys need to have farm to table steakhouses. Number one, it'll help tourism. Yeah. Yeah, this whole thing drives me crazy. It's bad for the environment. You guys should be marketing that like this beef was made here, killed here, served here. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. And like, I'm, I'm a tourist here this week. I wanted to experience like Omaha beef in the steakhouse. Like, I don't even know if this is from Omaha because it came back to us from Chicago. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, if you go to New York, besides Bauhaus, Peter Luger's. It's the best steakhouse in the world. Another question here. What's the creative process you used when you started screen printing? Did, was it solo artists, or did you have a team together? Or how'd you get your designs? My ex at the time was, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, not my ex, but my girlfriend at the time um, was a really, really gifted artist. Now she's designing like the, the pleasures bottle for Estee Lauder. Really, really creative girl. And she, had, she, she didn't know anything about like streetwear, but I would direct her. And she knew how to use Adobe Illustrator Photoshop. I can't even draw. But I would direct her, like, yo, put it here, put it there. And that, that's what it was. Like, I never saw not being able to draw or not being an artist as an impediment. I found people to, like, be my arms and legs that I needed. Great. I think we have time for one last question over here. OK. Loaded question. Favorite sneakers? Go. Ooh. <laughs> Man, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I've always said the fire red Jordan 5s because they meant so much to me. But I got these 11s that my boy Kenzo Digital gave me. I wear them at every speaking engagement. They're dope. Um, man, the Air Penny 2s, when they came out, I lived in Orlando. That's a big deal. The Union 180s. But yeah, uh, my De La Soul Dunks, my boy Steve gave me. Uh, the shoes I'm connected to are the ones that had like a story behind them. Like my mom wouldn't get them or a friend gave them to me because I couldn't find them. Like those are the best. Like, like sneakers are mad cool that way. So all right, thank you.